Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Mark Goulston, Dr. Mark Goulston. Welcome, Mark. It's a pleasure to have you on. So, well, it's great to be with you again, John. <laughs> we'll tell that story. Uh, those of you who are new to the show know that Grace Under Pressure covers what's often called the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment that we show for others. And when you do it as a leader, uh, and Mark advises many of them, um, you do it to bring people together for common cause. So welcome, Mark. And I want to tell everybody about you. Um, first of all, you are a UCLA trained business psychiatrist. Uh, you have a long track record of working with um, all kinds of organizations, including the FBI, as a hostage negotiator. Uh, you have been on all kinds of television shows. You've been profiled everywhere. You're the author of many nine books, one of which, Just Listen, has been translated into 28, that's right, 28, count them, languages. Uh, that's a stellar. And I'm insanely jealous, but I can't be jealous of Mark because he's such a kind and gracious, gracious person who personifies grace. And today he's going to tell us about an exciting new concept he's working on called the Michelangelo mindset. Welcome, Dr. Mark Goulston. So, well, thank you, John. Uh, it, it, it's nice that, you know, one of the things that one of my mentors, Warren Bennis, told me is he said, one of the best things about people saying nice things about you is it gives you something to live up to. Well, that's good. So you're on the spot, man, because I built you up big time. <laughs> I, got, I, I got performance anxieties and butterflies, but I'm excited. Yeah. Well, you know, Mark, it's been you have a long career. And but what I always enjoy you is you're always experimenting. You're always doing something. And truth be told, I have followed in your wake because I know you started writing. I know your books and I was doing books and then you started doing blogs and then you were publishing here and publishing there and then doing podcasts and all this. So basically, Mark, I'm just copying the Mark Goulston playbook. So shame on me, but tribute to you, my friend. So. Well, that's even more to live up to. So uh, <laughs> let's have at it. Let's have at it. Yeah. Well, anyway, what I wanted to get at and is a new idea that you've been experimenting with, and it's do going very well, and it's called the Michelangelo Mindset. Tell us about that, please. So, Well, you know, I've, I've, I've been curious my entire life. Um, uh, I remember having a conversation with Warren Bennis, and one of our discussions, we said, what's the difference between a visionary leader uh, and a non-visionary leader or uh, the manager mindset? And we said that the visionary leader goes where they're looking, whereas the non-visionary leader looks where they're going. And if you think about, uh, I, I will often speak about the visionary mindset. And if you think of Steve Jobs or Elon Musk, one of the things that differentiates them from other people is they see the unknown as an adventure to be lived whereas too many other people see the unknown as a danger to be avoided. In fact, when I've given presentations on how to think like Steve Jobs and Elon Musk, it's now converted to the Michelangelo mindset. I said, one of the reasons that they both love drugs, psychedelics, is because uh, th there's something between divergent thinking, which is what when you just look out at the world and see what the world reveals to you, but they also have convergent thinking where they can bring it to, together into a product, be it a, a Macintosh, an iPhone, or a Tesla. And because they tend to be controlling personalities, I think one of the reasons unconsciously they liked psychedelics is because it enabled them to have that divergent, I'll just look at anything experience, because they had the confidence that they would come back to Earth and maybe create something. And, and the Michelangelo mindset's a little bit like that. And, and what we love about it is there's an elegance and eloquence to the Michelangelo mindset. And of course, what people know we're referring to is that he was able to imagine, see, and realize something like the Statue of David in a piece of marble. That's great. I, I love the eloquent, eloquence and elegance. So uh, envisioning uh, something inside an inert optic, uh, excuse me, an inert 
object. So tell us how that relates to what you do, uh, Mark. Well, well, it's interesting. So, so it would be uh, seeing uh, something clearly and carving away what's not there. I, I had a session with a fairly difficult but really smart uh, uh, executive yesterday. And I said, this is what I said to him. I said, and I'm a little bit like Marshall in, in terms of being a little bit bold, flirting with brazen. We're talking about Marshall Goldsmith. I hope it's chutzpah as opposed to brazenness, but it could be a little bit of both. And so uh, I said to him, I said, you have a smartness that occasionally flirts with brilliance and you need to carve away everything that gets people uh, in the way of their appreciating your smartness flirting with brilliance, because too often you intimidate people, you're sarcastic, you're cynical, and you know this smartness flirting with brilliance was God-given, and if you don't get rid of that stuff, God gave it to the wrong person. <laughs> uh, that's the other thing I like about you. You don't pull any punches. <laughs> but, but here's, so here's part of the matter. So there's lots of verticals, Michelangelo marketing, Michelangelo leadership, Michelangelo parenting, Michelangelo. Mar so this is Michelangelo leadership. I said inside uh, the people who are under you, who are now afraid of you or resent you, what they want to do is they want to feel trust, confidence and respect for you. And here's it's very simple. Trust. Uh, you engender trust in other people by doing what you say you'll do. And when you don't know, you're honest, but you're on you're on track with we're going to find out a solution. So you don't keep people hanging forever. Confidence is a track record. And so, you know, one of the favorite stories of Marshall Goldsmith that we often hear about is Alan Mulally. He didn't know anything about cars when he went to Ford, but he knew a little bit about planes because he was at Boeing. So people had trust in him because he did what he would say he said he would do. They had confidence because of his track record at Boeing. And the third thing I told this leader is the way you gain respect is that there are certain values that you practice in your behavior. And value number one is you need to make your company psychologically safe. And if that's not a top priority in our working together, because one of the obstacles to that safety is you, uh, I'm going to fire myself. <laughs> Great. I like I like how you're weaving. Um, and, and you take this topic of Michelangelo mindset, and it begins with stone, which is I typically do not equate uh, emotional response to stone, except in a negative way when we say people have nothing. But you talk about the chipping away, the uncovering, and that leads to the inner beauty inside. Can I say that? So, mm hmm yeah, absolutely. Uh, something else that I will share. So hopefully we have in, uh, we have Michelangelo leadership locked and loaded. But for people listening in or viewing, Michelangelo marketing. You know, marketing is the thing that gives you the chance to make a sale. Marketing and selling is different. Marketing is your promise, your brand, and what you need to do is peak curiosity and. Uh, Michelangelo marketing is what's the least you can say that causes people to say, what's that about or how do you do it? That's good. I like, I like, I love that because that it's a kind of a teaser concept, but extending Michelangelo marketing, the same applies to us as humans or as leaders. We need to make it attractive for people to want to be with us or in a leadership position to want to follow us. Would you not agree, Mark? So. Well, we, yes, yes on steroids. So we need to not only make it attractive, so that so the David in the block of marble of Michelangelo marketing is what you want to trigger in other people. And this is the David of Michelangelo marketing is you want to trigger, wow, I can't believe what I saw read or heard and when and in my work as a suicide prevention specialist for 20 years how they felt so what i triggered in my suicidal patients was hope inside all their hopelessness so the wow is i can't believe what i saw heard read or felt the hmm hmm is 
this is too good to ignore. I don't know how we're going to use it, but I'm not going to throw it away. And the yes is I see how we're going to use it, sold. And for a year and a half, I played Steve Jobs coming back from the dead. I had the turtleneck. I had the glasses. And the whole purpose of it was to highlight one event in his life at Apple. And it was the moment that he discovered the graphical user interface and mouse at Xerox Park. Because there, and I show a video. If your listeners or viewers look up Xerox Park National Geographic Steve Jobs, you'll see a two minute video of a dramatization of his discovering the mouse and the graphical user interface. And if you look at the expression on his face, you'll see him go, Wow. And, and you know what? I know that story. You know what's wonderful about it, and it ties to your work, is that. Xerox, it was at Xerox Park. And so Xerox had this as a part of its IP and said, we don't have any use for it. And doesn't that sometimes agree with us as we look inside? We may not, we feel we're lacking in self-worth. So. Yeah, absolutely. And so, so, so let's lock and load. Michelangelo marketing is, uh, is what you want to trigger in your market in your people, in your investors, in talent you're trying to poach from your competitor is, wow, I can't believe what your company's doing. Hmm, are they hiring? Because I'd rather work for your company than my company. And then if you say, I think there's an opening, yes, can I give you my resume? So you want to trigger, wow, hmm, yes. But you, you mentioned something else, which is a much more personal thing. And this is, this is Michelangelo purpose. How do you discover your purpose in life? So there's an exercise I do with people. And I say, I'd like you to imagine that your personality is a circle. And inside the circle are the parts of you that are trying to prove something, show something, hide something, or please someone. Prove, show, hide, or please. And when I do this in presentations and we do the exercise, I say, I would like you to imagine going on a long walk and eliminating the parts of your personality that are trying to prove, show, hide, or please what is left. And many people will say nothing. Yeah, I was just going to say that. <laughs> yes. and, and, but here's the point. If you sculpt away the prove, show, hide, please part of your personality, you may discover a purpose or calling that's been dialing you up, but getting a busy signal for decades. Oh, that's great. Busy. Yeah. So, so busy proving, showing, hiding, or pleasing. I know you have uh, done that exercise, a form of that exercise with me, Mark. And so that's, yeah, so uncovering what's in the real us. And I think when we do that, it's very self-affirming and you would and, and finding um, some, there's a concept. In, and I've talked to Chester uh, Elton and Adrian Gostick about this for their book, Leading uh, with Gratitude, is the concept of self-gratitude. Be thankful for what you are and who you are. And in doing so, it's not a pat on the back, but it's saying, hey, I have value and maybe somebody else will find value, too. So. Yeah, so I'm going to play shrink with you because I told you I would, and you sort of trust me. And if I get us in trouble, I promise you we'll get you out of trouble. What, <laughs> what John is referring to is he has pivoted. He's actually pivoted to this, uh, this show, Grace Under Pressure. And grace is not a way that John would have characterized himself or others would have characterized him because John is a is a duty-bound soldier. He's a journeyman communicator, and he's written some amazing books, and he deserves all the awards he's gotten. But he recently took a pivot into grace, and he shared with me, and maybe he'll tell you how you can get his collection of poems. And, and he pivoted, and he pivoted because he looked out in the world and the pain and the incivility got to him. So can you share a little bit of that and uh, 
and sure. step, step out of yeah. having the proper in prime time persona. Again. <laughs> prime time counseling right here, live on camera and later taped. Uh, yes, uh, very much so. I, I've, I've done a lot of work in leadership and um, I'm proud of it. But I became increasingly um, upset, dis irritated, uh, disgusted, angered by the lack of civil discord. And I saw it in our culture. We're being mean to one another. But at the same time, i am always been intrigued with the concept of grace, which is, the, I call it the catalyst for good, for the greater good. And I said, you know, I could write a screed, but who cares? Who? That's just adding, you know, fire, gasoline to the fire. So I said, I'm going to take the opposite thing. And I looked around, Mark, and I saw people like you who radiate kindness and compassion. And I want call me naive, but I see I find more goodness, more kindness, more compassion in the world, certainly than we give it credit for. And so I explored this in my book, Grace, A Leader's Guide to a Better Us. And then later, when COVID struck, I had the opportunity to do this show, Grace Under Pressure, where I've talked to thought leaders and doers like you and so many of us. I've talked to men and women in the military and business leaders and our fellow thought leaders and members of uh, Marshall Goldsmith 100 coaches, people who are making a positive difference. And we talked about, we talk about the pressures of leading in uncertain times. And I think we all need grace, whatever, if we're a, in a leadership position or not, but grace is that facilitates kindness, compassion, respect for others. And I would say that grace is complementary to the Michelangelo mindset, my friend. So. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I've been thinking a lot about grace in the last 24 hours. Uh, 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 I'm, what I'm referring to is we did this show uh, uh, yesterday, but uh, the, the, the technology on John's end didn't work out. So we're doing it again. And, and, and according to him, I graciously said, it's going to be even better today. It's okay. Forgive yourself. Let yourself off the hook. Uh, and, 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 and here's something else I'd like you to unpack because you're doing grace under pressure. I think when you create a state of grace between you and another person, you give them the space to choose to be involved instead of having to do something. So, so that's so powerful, you know, and and Mark, that gets back into um, you can hire me to sell your thing. Uh, the Michelangelo marketing mindset, because isn't a sale a choice? Um, we, we may need it. We may want it. But the marketing says you need this and we choose. Nobody reaches into our wallet and steals it. We choose. And that's what you're saying. How much better to live life by choice than by compulsion? So. Yeah, absolutely. In, in fact, uh, close to two years ago, I spoke in Moscow with Daniel Kahneman, uh, and my five of my nine books have done very well in Russia. And, and my talk was change everything you know about communication. If I go back, it'll be Michelangelo mindset. And, and here's what I did with a thousand Russian leaders, managers, business people. I said, if I focus on you listening to me and I deliver bullet points and I have some good stories that I'm engaging, you'll give me your mind for an hour. And then here was my Michelangelo mindset shift. I said, but if instead of focusing on you listening to me and giving me your mind for an hour, I focused on what you're listening for. And I got what you were listening for without you telling me. And if I delivered on what you were listening for, uh, without you telling me and without having an agenda of my own, you'll give me everything. And then I said, here's what, and here's what you're listening for. And by the yeah. way, if you're viewing this show, I think many of you, this is what you're listening for. What I told the audience is you're listening for a way to get better measurable <laughs> results because that's how you get a raise or you get promoted. Is that true? The audience went, duh. And then I said, and you're listening for a way to do that that's less stressful because you're all drinking too much, you're eating too much, your people are doing the same. It's a mess. Is that true? Duh. And I, <laughs> most of all, what you're listening for is that I can give you some immediately doable by you tactics that you can use right now to get those results without stress. And you don't have to buy a book because I haven't written this book yet. 
And by the way, I will never write this book. I might write a book on Michelangelo mindset. And you don't have to take a course. So there's no upsell. But if I can give you a tactical, doable by you way, and you don't have to like psychology, you don't even have to like insight. If I can give that to you and you can use it right now, it will be worth the chunk of money you paid to come here in a day of your time. Is that true? And they went, da, da. I said, sit down, sit down. I have to do a presentation. Come on. <laughs> right. And you know what? And, and that's, I, I'm likening it back to our previous conversation when you were explaining this. And you talked about your work in suicide prevention. And you said there's a, a wonderful concept feel felt. And I think that's related to the Michelangelo concept. Is it not? Absolutely. Um, uh, if you know anyone who's really suicidal or, or, uh, or very depressed, if you ask them, what's the difference between feeling understood and feeling felt? The difference is when you feel understood, that's better than feeling misunderstood, but you're still alone with all your pain. But when you feel felt, you're, you're in the pain with someone else. And what I discovered, because for 25 years, none of my patients, I'm now retired and, and teaching this around the world, none of my patients died by suicide. What I realized, and if you haven't been suicidal, you won't get this, but if you have, you will, is death is very compassionate to hopelessness that won't go away. And so people who feel that kind of pain attach to death, they put it in their back pocket and say, if worse comes to worse, I can always end it all. And so they feel felt by death as a way to end their pain. But if they can feel felt by you, what happens is they may let go of being attached to death and attach to what I'm calling surgical empathy. So during COVID, uh, I've co-authored two books. One's called Why Cope When You Can Heal. And I introduce, we introduce surgical empathy. And what surgical empathy is about is uh, uh, when people attach to not just to death, but dysfunctional leadership practices, dysfunctional behaviors, uh, when they attach to uh, uh, the stuff that got them here but won't get them there, to quote our friend Marshall, they have to let go of that stuff because it won't get them there. And by empathizing with them, they may be, and, fe and they're feeling felt by that, they may let right. go of dysfunctional behaviors and grab onto you. And I think we all, that's such a powerful story. Thank you. And getting into empathy, I, I have said this, and uh, I think in our last 18 months, empathy has become a kind of a buzzword. And I'm not going to push back on that because it's raised the consciousness of the concept. And I think that um, empathy is so important. It's what people are looking for. But how do leaders demonstrate empathy, Mark? So, well, I'll tell you, this is how parents do. And if you're a leader and you care about uh, someone, maybe a business partner, I'm not sure you have the time for a deep subordinate, although they deserve it. And, and, and you may remember that I gave four prompts in one of our uh, MG100 calls when we discussed mental, uh, mental health. And so if you're worried about a teenager or an employee or a business partner, here are the four prompts. You take them aside and say, can I ask you a few questions because I'm concerned about you? Hopefully they'll say, okay. And you say, at its absolute worst, how awful are you capable of feeling about your life and yourself? And that opens the gate. That's the beginning of a little bit of surgical empathy. And if they say pretty awful, you can say, I think it's worse than that. And then you say, and, and when you're feeling that, how alone do you feel? And frequently they're going to say, uh, very alone. And then the third thing you do is you say, take me to the last time you felt it. And here's something th therapeutic and magical that happens when someone can describe to you something so clearly that you can see it with your eyes, they refeel it. So when they say, well, I left work last week and, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I drove to the, I drove to the railroad tracks and I sat there for a long time and, uh, you know, and then I got a hold of myself and 
but I can't say that I won't go back to the railroad tracks. So, so when right. someone is telling you something that clearly they're not alone with it, right. and then if you're a caring parent, and I think if you're a leader who, who, who doesn't want to have to then deal with the aftermath of someone in your company dying by suicide, and then you have to deal with the whole culture about it, what you say to that person, if you're a parent, parent or leader is, I have a favor to ask that when you're starting to feel that way again, I want you to do whatever it takes to get either my undivided attention, our HR director's undivided attention, our EAP program's undivided attention, um, because I don't want you coming up with that permanent solution to a temporary problem. That's powerful. So, Mark, when you hear people say that, and that, that's a thank you for those and that very cogent advice, when you hear people say, I'm feeling so alone. What do we as the listener do? So what you want to do is uh, same. Uh, when you hear someone say something and, and one of the words has emotional juice on it, feeling so alone, what you say is tell me more about so alone. And so it, it's like peeling away the layers of an onion and then uh, and then you can say to them, say a little bit more. So one of my mentors was one of the, pi what was the suicide prevention, what Warren Bennis was the leadership. And one of his ways of uh, peeling away the layers of an onion is he, he would say, say a little more. Say a little more. And then you can mix that up with what's really going on. But the point is, see, the reason we don't do this, and I'm writing an article, why do we give advice and solutions that other people don't want? What a lot of people are afraid of, if they're managing their own anxiety, is they don't want to, to feel what I call hopelessness, helplessness, contagion. Because this is feeling that when you're with someone, you know, that, they're, that their uh, angst will crossover into you. In fact, Cicely Saunders started the hospice movement in England. Cicely Saunders. And one of her recommendations to people when you're visiting people who are terminally ill is don't just do something, stand there. Mm. That's a power. What a powerful thing. And that um, one of the folks that I have profiled is, uh, and you probably you may know him, uh, Father Greg Boyle in Los Angeles, the um, and of um, uh, Homeboy Industries. And he talks about this radical kinship, and that, and and it's partly just being there, is it not? So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he was a guest on my Wake Up Call podcast. So. Uh, as John is going to be. So I hope you'll check that out. If you look up my wake up call and check out Father Greg Boyle, he was, he was wonderful, as was Ken Blanchard. They, they just overflow with radical kindness and compassion. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Good. Mark, we are racing along here. And so we're coming to um, the big question that I ask all of my guests. And it's a story of grace. And I know you have one. And will you share it with us, please? So. To me, grace is listening with and from love. And I'll share with you something that you've already heard. But uh, there's, there's an origin story to all of us. And my origin story is I dropped out of medical school twice, uh, probably for untreated depression. The school wanted to kick me out. The head of the school referred me to the dean of students because he was probably afraid that I might do something self-destructive. And I came from a background where you're only worth what you do in the world. And this is what the dean of students said to me when I was at a low point. He said, Mark, uh, you didn't mess up because you're passing everything, but you are messed up. But if you got unmessed up, I think this school would be glad they gave you a second chance. And I started to cry. And he said, and Mark, even if you don't get unmessed up, even if you don't become a doctor, even if you don't do anything the rest of your life, I'd be proud to know you because you have a deep streak of goodness and kindness that the world needs. And we don't grade in medical school. We should, but we don't. Uh, and you, you won't know how important that is to the world until you're 35, but you need to stay alive until you're 35 and you're going to let me help you. And I let him help me. Yeah. 
That's great. What a wonderful story of grace. And it's, um, it's a compliment to you. And, and um, I know that's, but it's also the compassion that you were shown. And I know, Mark, that was a transformative event because you did complete medical school. You are a board certified psychiatrist and you have been living the life of grace and kindness and enriching uh, so many with your words of wisdom. Mark, how can we find you? So, well, you can find me, uh, you can check out michelangelomindset.com. It's really early beta, but someone told me th that it's the apple of personal and professional development. And I think it could be. It's a way of looking at the world through Michelangelo's eyes and then carving away everything that gets in the way of success, happiness, and fulfillment for people. Also, my LinkedIn profile is pretty up to date and my wake up call is my podcast. And finally, my personal uh, website is pretty decent, markgoulston.com. Mark, it's been a pleasure to have you. And uh, now it's a time in the show where I get to say if you want to know more about me, visit my website, johnbaldoni.com. Thank you, Mark. And with that, we'll sign off. So.